Welcome all and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Robin Dixon and I'm a senior viticulturist at the AWRI. So I'm joining you today from Fox Creek Wines, where we are hosting a pruning workshop. Uh, so covering all things grapevine trunk diseases. Uh, as we gather here for this webinar from lands across Australia and the globe, let us take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and in do, doing so recognise the various traditional lands on what, which we do our business today. We acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of all the land we work and live on and their ancestral spirits with gratitude and respect. So today I'm joining you from Ghana land. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. So in this session, we'll look at grapevine viruses um, and the biosecurity threat they pose to viticulture. If you would like more information about other biosecurity challenges that face our industry, I encourage you to go back and watch the webinar we hosted last year on new findings and implications of latest phylloxera research. And we also had a webinar last year titled Winter Pruning to Increase Longevity of Vines, which also covers grapevine trunk diseases. So if you're particularly interested in grapevine trunk diseases, we have a full webinar planned for on the topic for September. So watch out for that. So before we jump in and make a start, a quick a couple of quick reminders to anyone who is new to AWRI webinars. Um, so if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, uh, click on the Q&A button down below, type in your question and um, press send and it will be sent through to us. We'll have the Q&A session at the end of the presentation but you can ask questions at any time. Also a reminder that the webinars are recorded uh, and they are made available via the AWRI's YouTube channel. So you just jump on the AWRI website, uh, click in, um, type in webinars and it will come up with a list of the webinars for the future and webinars um, that have been recorded. So for anyone who has just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is Grapevine Viruses, a Biosecurity Challenge for Viticulture. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Fiona Constable from Agriculture Victoria Research. Fiona leads a microbiology group of Agriculture Victoria Research. She has more than 30 years of experience in plant virology and phytoplasmas of grapevines and other horticultural crops, including ecology, diagnostics and biosecurity. Her expertise is rec recognised and highly respected both nationally and globally. If you're ready to go, I'll hand over to you, Fiona. Thanks, Robin. Thanks for the great introduction. I'll just share my screen um, and uh, share. And so you should be able to see that. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about viruses today. Um, and I'm sure some of you may have heard um, a bit of this talk before, but I hope you still find it useful. Um, so just to start, um, it's more than 90 viruses that occur in grapevines worldwide um, and the number grows almost annually uh, with the new technologies that we apply to, to try and characterise the virome of, of plants. And um, so in this case, people keep discovering new viruses. Um, and with that, in the past, when I've given this talk, I've often talked about just 10 viruses, but with some of the research work done by Chi Wu for her PhD, she's described a few additional viruses. Um, most of those viruses that she's found, those new ones are not significant from a biosecurity point of view. Um, on this slide, um, you can see here the names of quite a number of viruses that occur in Australia. Um, and the ones with the green arrows are 
vector borne and are often associated with serious disease, um, particularly GBA and the leaf roll viruses. Um, Pinot Gris virus is, um, the jury's still a bit out about the seriousness of that virus for Australia, but it does cause significant disease overseas. So, oh, and I should mention um, leaf roll two is also really important. We don't find that quite so frequently, um, but it can also be associated with leaf roll and some other serious problems. So viruses are associated with a, a number of diseases. Um, and here you can see the list of diseases. So leaf roll disease, which many of you will be familiar with, and you can see um, disease associated with um, leaf roll three, Above, you can see the impact on um, bunches, on some Cabernet Sauvignon, I think it is, and then the symptoms that appear on a grafted uh, Shiraz um, grapevine here that I, I took a photo of, um, probably in the Yarra Valley. Um, they're also associated with rugose wood complex. So that's what that literally means is rough wood and some of the viruses can cause significant pitting um, and grooving in the trunks of grafted vines or, or, and, um, or on any vines, susceptible vines. Um, and they are sometimes associated with grafting compatibilities. Um, a lot of work is being done at the moment by Chi um, Wu for a PhD on Shiraz disease. And you can see the little image over here on the, on the right, um, where the vines display reddening late into the season. Um, uh, they tend not to harden off um, and become quite limp and that, that reddening in those leaves can stay a present um, for long after the leaves have dropped off other vines. Um, viruses also cause botches and mosaics and, and these other symptoms we, we see here. Um, and in the case of grapevine Pinot Gris virus, it's associated with leaf model and leaf deformation. And you can see some of those symptoms at the bottom. Um, on the right in Pinot Gris, the leaves are quite modelled. And on Tremena, where you can see that the leaves are, are quite distorted as well. A lot of the viruses can also lead to degeneration and decline of the vine, which is really impactful for production of um, fruit. The, uh, it's not just yield, it's also fruit quality. Um, viruses uh, can impact on things like tannin content and sugar content, um, and they then lead to that loss of sustainability of, of productive vineyards. Um, when you've got multiple virus infections, um, sometimes the, the problems become even more compounded. Um, so the mixture of viruses can sort of harness greater elements of the vines to cause more significant disease. Um, but on the converse of that is, there are some grapevine varieties that are highly tolerant to virus infection. A lot of table grapes seem to be tolerant to, to leaf roll viruses. Chardonnay is quite tolerant to things like leaf roll three, but um, if it were infected with leaf roll two, you would see a really significant issue. Um, so we do get symptomless infections, um, but they're very important, those symptomless infections um, for, the, for the ecology and, and the way in which disease develops um, elsewhere in the vineyard in different varieties because they become a source of virus um, for further infection. Um, we also know that there's strain variation that impacts uh, the way in which disease expresses on grapevines as well. Um, and we know that environment also impacts on symptom expression. Um, my experience was in 2009 when I had um, field grafted grapevines uh, in the Yarra Valley and we had that extreme weather that led to the severe bushfires. I mean, in that year, I didn't see any symptoms, even though I could still see detect virus in those vines. Um, there are some of those minor viruses, as I mentioned earlier, that don't seem to cause disease at all and, and they're not significant. So some of the significant ones are the leaf roll viruses. You can see uh, symptoms appearing later in the season, so late in summer and early autumn. And on the left-hand side, you can see the range of symptoms that you might see in different varieties and um, with different, different virus types or different species. So, um, leaf roll three can cause quite significant issues in, in Cabernet Franc and, and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, leaf roll one might be milder in some of these varieties uh, and you can see some mild symptoms on, on the Pinot Noir. 
Um, so that's just really to give you the feel for the range of symptoms. Sometimes we see leaf rolling and it can be quite tight, but other times the leaves don't roll very strongly at all. And as I said earlier, there's a um, symptom expression is definitely dependent on the species and the strain, um, whether there are mixed infections with other, other grapes and the varieties in the environment. Um, we know that after inoculation, symptoms can take greater than 12 months to appear. So you might not know that you've actually got a virus infection for some time. Um, and um, to really confirm the symptoms, it's really important that you confirm the presence of the virus with a laboratory test. Um, and that's important because these symptoms here can actually, there's other things that look like leaf roll diseases. And unless you've got a keen eye, um, uh, you really need to, to confirm it with the test. Um, the important um, aspect of leaf roll too is this grafting compatibility um, that happens with some very specific rootstocks. I think freedom is one of those um, where you just won't get graft take or you might get a little bit of graft take, but eventually the vines die. So the rough wood viruses, as we call them, um, associated, as I said earlier, with their stem grooving and pitting. Um, you can see a little mild pitting here and Shiraz disease and the grafting compatibilities that I talked about earlier. Um, grapevine virus A is probably the most important of the viruses that can be associated with the Rogos wood diseases. Um, it's definitely associated with Shiraz disease, I, I, and I keep talking about cheese PhD, she's close to the end. Um, and the interesting thing from cheese PhD seems that there is that specific association to a, a particular group of strains of, of grapevine virus A, um, uh, the, the group two strains um, versus group one and group three strains. So that, that, that just demonstrates that variability and how important it can be um, within the viruses and disease expression. Um, Shiraz disease seems to be an Australian and South African disease. It's not really viewed much um, in other countries. Um, we see it on mainly in Shiraz, Melbeck and Merlot. Um, and the leaf and wood symptoms might not be so obvious with GBA um, down the track, uh, but they do sometimes, they will appear eventually. Um, and again, um, because other things cause similar symptoms, you should confirm with a laboratory test. Um, grapevine virus B is present in Australia, but not that we find it very frequently in our testing. Overseas, it's been associated with corky bark disease, um, but we don't see corky bark in Australia. We've never really understood why, um, and it's probably down to the strains. Um, so we're very lucky in that we don't have to manage that disease. Grapevine repestris stem pitting um, causes stem pitting um, in um, repestris St George rootstocks. Um, this virus is really prevalent in Australia. About 95% of, of grapevines that we test seem to have it, um, and it doesn't appear to cause significant disease. Um, but if you do see graft failure, there may well be times when repestris could contribute to that. Grapevine Pinot Gris viruses are new to some, well, it's not that new now, um, it was described about 10 years ago um, uh, when the Italians saw leaf modelling and defamation on their grapevines, um, and particularly in Pinot Gris, and that is um, why it's called Grapevine Pinot Gris virus. Um, and it's really, you will see symptoms of this um, earlier in the growing season. Um, you'll see stunting because the internodes um, uh, become shorter uh, and you get this quite bushy aspect to the vine. Um, overseas, it's been associated with significant yield loss and reduced vigor of the grapevines. Um, and they did suspect an association between specific strains and disease. Um, but Camel Preet, who's a PhD student working with me, um, has not seen that association in Australia. Um, we rarely see um, the mottling and leaf deformation, although we have seen it in one vineyard, but we're still not sure whether grapevine Pinot Gris was actually associated with those symptoms or whether there was something else involved. Um, overseas, it can be found in some vineyard weeds. We've not found it in weeds yet in Australia. Um, and so we're still trying to determine the impact of, of this virus in, in Australian viticulture. Viruses are transmitted um, in a number of ways. Uh, insects are an important um, uh, aspect of, of the virus ecology and how they spread 
in vineyards. Um, so GVA, GVV, um, leaf roll one, three and four are all spread by mealybug and scale. Um, all viruses are spread through propagation. So if you take a cutting that's infected with the virus, um, you'll, you, you'll be moving it in that cutting. Um, they transfer when you graft um, or top work. Um, there is a little bit of evidence overseas that Repestris might be pollen-borne, um, but none of the viruses are seed-borne, which is really handy, and um, they're not transmitted mechanically on equipment. So if you're pruning in a vineyard, um, the risk of transmitting a virus on your, on your clippers from one vine to another is, is um, unlikely. So um, what I want to point out, as I always point out, is when you do have an infection in a vineyard, in a grapevine, um, particularly those that are transmitted through insect vectors, um, so in the case of the leaf rolls and GVA, GVB, the scales, the millibug, um, for GP, GV, um, bud and blister mite is a vector, um, those infected vines are a source of infection um, for other vineyards, um, other vines um, and, and, and other blocks. And, if you don't see symptoms in one block, they still can be that reservoir for something that is susceptible. So you do need to be very mindful um, of, of infection. Once you've got the infection, it's absolutely for life. Um, so viruses move within the vascular tissues of grapevines in the phloem um, and distribute throughout the grapevine, although they can be unevenly distributed or in uneven concentration, which impacts on detection. Um, so a vector will come and deposit the virus directly into the phloem and then they just move systemically. Um, and uh, you might not see symptoms, as I said earlier, for one to two years after, in, after an infection event. Um, and similarly, um, if you graft, um, once the vascular tissues connect, then the viruses move between the vascular tissues and throughout the vine as well. Um, this is just some work that we did a few years ago just to show what detection looks like. So we grafted um, pre-December onto a whole bunch of grapevines. This is for leaf roll two on the Shiraz. And um, we got a little bit of a detection in the first sort of 12 months or so. It was very, very difficult to detect the virus. So only one out of five grapevines that we inoculated we could detect. Um, but then when we got to the following year, detection improved and then improved throughout. So it's really just to demonstrate um, how long it can take um, to be able to reliably detect and find a virus after an infection event. Um, as I said earlier, um, viruses persist um, in grapevines. They become a source of infection for other vineyards if they're transmitted by insect vectors. Um, and they can live in remnant roots. So when you pull out a grapevine that might be infected, um, you need to manage the remnant roots as well to prevent um, further spread from anything that reshoots from those. Um, some of the infect, some of the vectors, particularly um, uh, mealybugs, um, can live and feed on those remnant roots. They're subterranean, um, and also on those emerging leaves um, once they um, come up from the ground. Um, and as I said earlier. Top working viruses move both ways, either from the rootstock to what you graft on or from what you graft on to the rootstock and can cause grafting compatibilities. So these are the leaf roll vectors and GVA vectors, merely bug and scale. These are all the vectors that have been reported globally. Um, those vectors that appear in red on this table have not been recorded in Australia and that's actually a really good thing um, because some of the vectors that are reported here, particularly things like um, Planococcus ficus and Pseudococcus maritimus, the grapevine mealybug and grape mealybug are actually very uh, efficient vectors and this is why there tends to be significant issues, um, particularly with the leaf roll viruses in countries like South Africa, um, where they can see spread and infection to an entire vineyard within less than 10 years. Um, the semi-persistent um, transmission, so what that means is that eventually um, when uh, the merely bug or scale will actually eventually lose the virus as they sort of shed their, their skins and sort of grow. Um, but the other side to that is that they can um, reacquire. Um, there's no strict vector virus species um, in specificity for transmission. So what that means is that 
any of these merely bug or scale could acquire a leaf roll one, leaf roll three, leaf roll four or, or GVA and then transmit it, um, although there might be some degree of, of efficiency um, difference in, in the spread. So um, they're also really adaptable. Um, they live in lots of different climates, um, in, but they prefer those cool, warm climates and um, temperature impacts their life cycles. Um, so these are probably some of the most important um, uh, vectors that we see in Australia. Um, and uh, this is just a, a few images of what you might look for um, in a vineyard. Um, mealybugs in particular are important um, because they have multiple generations per year. So um, that increases that risk for acquiring a virus and transmitting it. The greater the population you have of a vector, the greater the risk you have for transmission. Um, these are scale. Um, I often only have one generation, but they can have multiple generations. And again, um, you know, the number of generations can really uh, affect uh, transmission and the volume. I've been in some vineyards where I've seen places crawling with um, those brown scale that you see on the bottom left. And, um, and so you just know that that's a, a specific risk. Um, the most efficient of the, um, of the life stages of the, of the mealybug and scale of the crawlers. So they're the ones that can acquire and they're efficient simply because they move within the vineyards um, to transmit. Whereas once you get to the adults, um, they tend to stay put uh, and, and don't move very far. And this again is just the life cycle. I won't go into too great a detail. I love entomology, um, but um, uh, I'm not an entomologist. so. So the number of generations of your vectors are dependent on temperature. So if you get to that right sort of temperature, um, I guess it's uh, sort of in the high 20s, high teens, low 20s, then you can increase the number of generations. Um, but once you get to the really hot temperatures or you get quite cold, then the population growth slows down because you see, and you see greater death of the insects. So those sort of mid-range temperatures are really um, important for um, transmission and uh, with associated to the vector biology. Um, they all overwinter underneath the bark and in cracks in the posts. So if you're looking for um, mealy bug and scale, it's really important to carefully check vines. You might not think you have a problem, but they actually might be sitting underneath um, areas where you can't see them readily. Um, some of the mealybugs, as I said earlier, can occur down on the roots as well and can then emerge to transmit. Um, there's no winter dormancy, so um, if you get the right sort of temperatures, you might still see activity through winter. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, the crawlers transmit viruses um, more efficiently, um, be simply because of the way that they move. Um, and I just want to remind you that after an infection event, symptom expression um, can take more than one season. So um, just because you don't see merely bug or scale in a, a particular year doesn't mean that you haven't got an infection. You have to continually monitor your vineyards to make sure that, that those symptoms don't occur. Um, this is an example of, of how um, merely bug and scales can sort of spread. They tend to go down rows rather than between rows because it's easier to crawl along from one vine to the other. Um, and these are just some examples of brown scale. I'm not sure you can see them very readily, but they do occur. Um, and in this particular vineyard, um, the, the person had leaf roll one, leaf roll three, leaf roll four and GVA. So all of those viruses were spreading. Um, so population densities affect the rate of spread of the viruses. Um, so the more insects you have, so the greater the number of generations and, and how many eggs they produce will ultimately affect um, how quickly transmission occurs. Um, all life stage, stages can acquire and transmit the viruses, but as I keep saying, the, the crawlers, they're the primary dispersal stage and that's what makes them most efficient, um, just because they're so easy to move through a vineyard. Um, they can walk um, between the vines, they get caught up on the wind and get carried um, from one vine to another. And all, all of the stages of, of, of um, merely bug and scale go through on your equipment and on your infected nursery stock and on people. Um, so if you've got an infestation, it's better to work 
um, in your cleaner areas first and move to the infected areas to try and control the mealybugs. Um, don't go from something heavily infested into something that's not so infested. Um, as I said earlier, grapevine pinagree virus is transmitted by um, Pilomerus virus, which is your bug and blister mite. Uh, and, and like the others, it's semi-persistent uh, uh, semi transmission, so it will eventually lose the viruses. They acquire the virus really quickly, so within four hours, and then they can almost immediately transmit it. Um, and like your crawlers for mealybug and scale, they get dispersed on wind, equipment, people, grafting material. And so it's really important to maintain control if you think you've got GPGD in your, um, in your vineyard. Um, and particularly as we still don't really fully understand the problems associated with viruses, uh, this particular virus. So GPGV has had um, uh, alternative hosts recorded, and you can see a list of uh, the pictures of them down, down the bottom and, and a list of the species that are reported overseas. We've not yet found them in alternative hosts in Australia. Um, but the good news is that all the other viruses, the leaf roll viruses, GBA, GVB, FLEC, and Repestris, and um, grapevine Repestris, vein feathering virus don't seem to have alternative hosts. They're quite strict um, to grapevine. Um, a virus infection is for life, so you're better off to prevent um, than to try and cure it. Um, so um, we have, fortunately, when things get imported into the country, they come through post-entry quarantine and they screen for the exotic viruses. Um, but then once they come on shore, we have certification programs. And so those certification programs pretty much equal high quality, high health planning material, the undergone testing. Um, they may have gone through um, a heat treatment process to eradicate viruses um, before propagating up into higher numbers. And um, certification programs tend to monitor and do annual testing for viruses as well. So it gives you greater confidence around the health status of your vines and, and the quality, ensuing quality that kind of comes from using high health planning material. Um, there's a great article um, in this journal, American Journal of Enology and Viticulture, where they saw that the cost benefit of using high health material was 60 to 1. Um, so I think that's pretty compelling. Uh, and that is definitely associated to, to quality of fruit and yield of fruit. So you should use pathogen testing material when you can get it and hopefully um, the important viruses are not detected. You'll probably always find material with repestris. It's very hard to eradicate. Um, and as I said earlier, it doesn't seem to cause significant disease, um, but you certainly would hope to be using material that doesn't have any of the leaf roll viruses or GVO, or GVB or Pinot Gris. Um, you need to monitor your vineyards. And if you see visual symptoms, you should definitely do active testing. And you should also be monitoring for vectors um, to prevent further spread um, in a vineyard if you think you have an infection. Um, you can remove infected grapevines. Um, there's probably a cost benefit associated with this where, um, you know, it gets to a point where, you know, is it worthwhile removing grapevines or trying to move forward? Um, low level of infection. I think New Zealanders have done some work where they've got about a 20% threshold um, of infected vines where they would, might remove them uh, and then go forward. We're yet to determine what that threshold would be for Australia. But um, as I said earlier, um, once you've got an infected lot vine, it is in you know a source of infection for others if if they are um, if there's insect vectors or if you want to take cuttings to propagate. Um, you could control for alternative hosts, but again, we don't really know um, for GPGV um, what those might be in Australia yet. Um, and all of this, as I said earlier, get your vines tested if you think you've got virus because um, symptom expression can be really influenced by environmental factors. Um, symptoms can, there's other things that look like virus symptoms and we get symptomless infections. Um, to control insect vectors, you should definitely be regularly monitoring your, your vineyards um, for, for scale mealybug and, and mites. Um, and these are just some of the, the things that you should look for in winter. So you look for that waxy residue and sooty mould and you need to look under the bark. In spring, um, keep eye out for craw crawlers. They're often found nearer to the crown. 
And in late harvest, you might see egg sac crawlers, you might see the whole range of different things, particularly where there's multiple generations occurring. Um, and you look into the dense parts of the canopy because they're quite protected in those areas. Um, ants are often a good indicator of scale and mealybug as well because they, um, they tend to look after the scale and mealybug because they benefit from, from the honeydew that, that's produced. Um, so again, it's when you're wanting to control for, for vectors, you definitely want to make sure you don't have infested planting material. Um, and if you can, easier said than done to minimise contact between plants. Um, but hey, um, if you can, you should try. Um, remove invested uh, material when you do have prunings because that then becomes a source for, for insects to move around the vineyard as well um, and try and control ants. Um, it's really hard to recommend insecticide control and I'm not a, a, a someone who can provide really great advice and you should seek um, the advice of agronomist around how to control for insects. Um, but they won't provide complete control and um, can impact the beneficial things that are in your vineyard, including your natural enemies that can control other insect pests. So um, definitely consider whether you should really be applying insect control. Um, it could be useful to use natural enemies. There's lots of little wasps and things that can be um, brought in to control for a lot of mealybug and scale. Um, and yeah, you should have a combined approach um, where you, you can try and manage sort of more naturally, but apply insecticides where you need to. Um, and keep monitoring and know where your hotspots are because you need, once you've got those hotspots under control, you should reduce your risk elsewhere. Um, good farm hygiene, um, it's just good biosecurity for anything, in fact. Um, just make sure your movement is from areas where there's low or no infestation to high infestation. Um, make sure people uh, keep, you know, clean boots and equipment and the like and, and um, to prevent that movement of, of vectors to control for viruses. Um, I keep saying it, a virus infection is for life and infected grapevines are a source for other, other vines. Um, if you're going to top work your vines, you definitely need to test because viruses can impact on graft compatibility. They also might just impact the, the variety that you graft on top. Um, you need to control vectors and um, removing infected vines, as I said earlier, um, can actually help to control spread of virus in a vineyard. Um, if you do remove a grapevine, try and remove as much of the remnant roots as you can. And um, yeah, you might want to do a soil drench of insecticide to get rid of mealybug that might be living subterranean, uh, in, subterraneanly, I can't say that word. And um, yeah, think about when it's economically useful to remove a vine um, and replace a vine rather than potentially replacing a whole vineyard or just trying to manage with what you've got. Um, and I can't uh, um, say hard enough how important it is to use clean planting material. Um, this vine, I won't go into too much great detail here, except that, um, as I said earlier, um, you really need to understand whether viruses are actually the cause of the problem in your vineyard. You might have some viruses, but maybe they're not the thing that's um, important. There could be some other thing that looks a little bit more like virus and you need to manage that instead. Um, there's plenty of abiotic things. Um, so nutrition um, and those kinds of things can uh, affect vineyard health and other pests and disease can affect vineyard health. And sometimes those things look a little bit like virus. Um, if your varieties aren't seriously affected, they could be a risk to other vineyards, but then um, they might not be. So I think, you know, it is really important to sort of assess whether, uh, uh, you know, say a Chardonnay vineyard affected, you know, infected with leaf for one, is it going to be impactful to the vines next door um, or is it isolated? And maybe if, if it is a bit more isolated, perhaps you can manage with that. And so that's, that's a business decision for you guys. Um, low level virus and infection, um, as I said earlier, you can think about removing vines. You definitely need to test neighbouring vines um, just to make sure that, as I said, that, that symptom expression takes longer than 12 months, so they might already be infected um, and just keep monitoring for disease. 
So um, as I said earlier, in New Zealand, um, they have a 20% virus incidence threshold for replanting a whole vineyard. Um, other, in Australia, it might not be, that might not be the threshold. And again, that, as I said, it needs some to be explored in Australia as to what's really the benefit of, of when you might replace or replant a vineyard. These are some of your lookalike diseases. Um, so nutrient deficiencies and herbicides can look a lot like virus. Um, so you see down at the bottom, there's chlorosulfurin damage, which looks a lot like grapevine pinot gris virus. There's some little phomopsis spots and leaf distortion on the bottom left. And you might think that that looks a bit like pinot gris. Um, potassium deficiency can look a lot like leaf roll. Um, so there's those kinds of things to keep in mind when you see symptoms. And so it's really, really important to actually uh, get a proper diagnosis done um, before you actually uh, make a decision on how to manage an effective vine. Um, how to sample. This is kind of a, a, a sampling strategy. Take a minimum of two shoots per vine, um, from one from each side of the trunk. Um, and take the lower half of a shoot. Um, we can take canes in winter or shoots in, in spring and um, autumn. Um, if you want to sample in summer, we can do that too, but it's best not to sample on really hot days. Um, and the labs like to have 20 to 30 centimetres of a shoot to, um, to, to try uh, to, to detect viruses in that. Um, definitely keep your samples cool um, and tag those vines so that you can go back and connect your results to, to the vines. Um, we've probably got a better chance of uh, detecting a virus in a symptomatic vine. Um, but if you haven't got symptomatic vines and you want to understand what might be um, uh, present in your vineyard before you do something like top walking, then you should randomly sample. And um, we can pull vines uh, uh, shoots from vines into one sample. We usually do up to five. Um, uh, Western Australia do up to 10 um, to try and reduce the cost of testing if you actually want to look at what the prevalence of virus might be in a vineyard that looks apparently unaffected um, to make that decision around things like top working. Um, and um, Affinity Labs, which used to be AWRI, our lab, um, Vinne from Adelaide Uni and Deepert are all working together to put together uh, a, a really good sampling strategy for industry. Um, so when you want to send samples in for testing, you've got a, a really good description of how to do that. Um, these are the three labs that actually undertake testing um, in Australia. Uh, so for grapevine viruses, so that's our lab here um, in Melbourne at Crop Health Services. Um, Australian Wine Research Virus Testing Service is um, now called Affinity Labs, and they, of course, do virus testing as well. We both those labs offer full testing for a broad range of viruses. Um, Deeper do a whole bunch of testing as well, and I think they probably have expanded the number of viruses that they test for as they move more towards molecular testing, um, and they can do they can provide that service too. So. Um, we've got three really great services that can support your virus testing. Um, I just wanted to highlight here that the three labs actually collaborate um, closely. Um, I know that in the past there's been a lot of discussion around reliability of the diagnostic tests and we're all working hard um, to, to coordinate the way in which we test um, so that we can ensure that we provide the most reliable um, results back to industry. Um, and that includes the development of a proficiency program. Um, oh, and there's my terrible um, last slide that I um, that is not finished. And I was going to talk about R and D. Um, so just briefly, um, there is R and D being done um, throughout Australia um, in in grapevine virology. Uh, Wine Australia are currently supporting. Chi, Wu and um, Camel Creek Cow to work on Shiraz disease and grapevine Pinot Gris virus respectively. Um, we've also, um, Vino Page um, has been doing some work uh, for hyperspectral imaging for um, detection of viruses in that way. And um, that may end up being a really great uh, a triage tool for, um, for detecting infection, particularly for red varieties, um, to sort of help, you know, the vine improvement programs, for example, to sort of hone in on an area where they may need to, to test for a hot spot of virus, for example. 
Um, the, the Rural R&D for Profit, which was federal government funding um, along with um, various um, uh, funding partners and their, their, and their partners. So that would be things like Wine Australia and Hoard Innovation um, and state government agencies. Um, we have a, a boosting diagnostics project and within that project, we're currently testing for, um, we're developing um, surge capacity testing for grapevine red blotch virus. And um, we've developed a national diagnostic protocol. Um, grapevine red blotch virus is, is exotic uh, and um, a high priority pest um, that causes significant damage overseas in the US and the symptoms look just like leaf roll virus. Um, so if you think you've got leaf roll virus and um, you don't get a leaf roll positive result, it may be worth testing for um, grapevine red blotch virus um, in case we have that outbreak here. Um, other R&D through that um, Rural R&D for Profit program is also uh, with DPIRD in Western Australia, so that, um, uh, the Diagnostic Laboratory Services um, is supported by Monica Kehoe and she's actually undertaking um, R&D activity um, to look at uh, nanopore sequencing, so it's a high throughput sequencing that allows you to sequence everything um, in a sample and she is applying that to grapevines um, to improve detection of viruses and that's something that perhaps all the labs will be able to pick up down the track to improve detection. Um, and with that, I think I'll stop because I could talk the leave off the chair and I'm happy to take some questions. Wonderful, thank you, Fiona. Um, that was a jam. That was jam packed with so much amazing information. Thank you. Um, so we've got a few questions that have started coming through. If anyone does have any questions, I encourage you to um, jump on the Q and A section down below and type in your question. So the first question for you, Fiona, is um, if a mealybug picks up the virus, how does it spread it? So is it through walking, flying, and how far can the infected bugs go? So, um, so it's usually it. it so what happens is the insect will feed on the on the vascular tissues on the phloem. Um, that's what they like to get their their nutrition from, and they pick up the virus while they're feeding, and then um, they become infected for a, a reasonable period of time um, until they kind of sort of shed and and emerge into the next stage of their life, um, and through that they can either walk from one vine to another. This is particularly for the crawlers or the juvenile sort of stages. Um, and then they feed on another grapevine and they, they spit that virus back into that grapevine. Um, they get, so that's a slow sort of spread, um, but you also will see that they get picked up on the wind. So they can actually be transported a reasonable distance on the wind. I don't know how far that would be, but it could be quite a while. And of course, on your clothes, on your equipment, and you could be taking them from one block to another or, or through the block or, or wherever that might be. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how that happens. <laughs> yeah. So I think in New Zealand, they um, showed that they could um, move um, significant distances, like a hundred meters either either way, um, and I think that comment you made about machinery is really critical as well. So if you're moving from an infected block to a, a, a block that's clean, really thoroughly cleaning down your equipment, particularly harvesters, um, is, is really critical. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to make a note, Biosecurity Tasmania also does testing for grapevine viruses and recently ran a screen through Tasmania. Hmm, that's good. I didn't realise Alan was doing it, so I know Alison. I'm sure it was Alison who was doing that, so that's really great that they're doing that. Wonderful. So thank you for that information. Um, a question from Adrian. What are the biological control agents for scale and mealybug? That's not my area of expertise, so I can't answer that one. No worries. <laughs> um, so we ran a workshop in... Um, 
Sunraysia last week and we were lucky enough to have Linda Thompson speaking and also Vaughan Bell um, from New Zealand speaking. So they um, both have done a lot of research in this area, particularly Linda on biological control agents. Um, but one um, so one predator that they spoke about was the mealybug destroyer, the cryptolemus. It's a lady ladybird um, that's really um, good at keeping mealybug num or um, controlling mealybug. But what Vaughan did mention was that they really need high populations of mealybug to um, sustain their populations within a vineyard. So his take home was really that parasitoids, so parasitic wasps, are really um, good tools to be able to use in the vineyard for biological control. But we know that these parasitoids are really um, affected by high sulfur rates, so anything over four um, kilos 400 um, grams per um, hect uh, per 100 liters, sorry, um, and also other insecticides, um, but also encouraging biodiversity in the vineyard. So planting flowering species is going to start attracting these biological control agents. So that's such a great question, Adrian. And um, I'll try to put up some links to some research on that topic um, in the chat. Um, area today. Um, so another one for you, Fiona. Um, in your current research, are there more prominent areas that have been that viruses have been detected? So which regions within Australia, or are they just all over in every region? Yeah, so for the leaf roll viruses and GBA, we tend to find them pretty much anywhere where grapevines are grown. Um, GPGV is a little bit different. Um, so there's a real hot spot for GPGV around the Sunraysia area, although we found it in other regions in South Australia and Victoria. Um, but yeah, for New South Wales, that sort of border region up there around Sunraysia and, and Victoria is, is where they tend to be really prevalent. And um, Camel Pret's been doing some really nice R&D around the diversity of the virus. Um, it, it, across it, across all the regions in South Australia and Victoria and New South Wales. And um, I think what she's found, it, it looks like we've had at least four different um, introductions of the virus because there's four very distinct clades of, of genetic clades of the virus. Um, and what, what we see in the Adelaide Hills is quite distinct from, from what we see in Sunraysia and, and some other areas. So it's really... Um, yeah, we see more strains in Sunraysia, but yeah, it's quite distinct. So it's really interesting, interesting stuff that might help us to sort of track and, and figure out how to manage the viruses down, down the track. Great, thank you. And another one, how important is grapevine fleck virus for reworking grafting mm. capsav? It's such a great question. Um, and the jury amongst virologists worldwide has always been out about the, the importance of FLEC. Sometimes on, um, I think it might be on Repestus St George, it causes vein necrosis kind of symptoms. Um, but often it doesn't seem to cause any significant disease at all. And so we've never really done the research we need to do to understand the importance of that virus. Um, but given that maybe on certain you know, rootstock types, it could cause vein necrosis, maybe it could be significant. But uh, yeah, it's a great question. We don't really know the answer to. Okay, thank you. Um, and just, uh, oh, Kath Kidman, you've got a question. Fiona, if a virus has symptoms that look like leaf roll three, but returns tests that have leaf roll nine or a complex of leaf roll nine and GBA, would you expect this to be as detrimental and contagious as leaf roll three or leaf roll one? Yeah, I think, um, Again, that's a really great question. And I think we don't really understand. We've never really done the R&D in Australia to understand the impact of the different viruses on productivity and quality. Um, but GBA and, and, and a leaf roll together 
it's usually leaf roll one or, or leaf roll three causes Shirelle's disease. You might see those types of symptoms again in Cabernet. Um, yeah, it, the potential is there um, and, and we don't really understand it. But I think mostly around the world, most people think leaf roll three is the worst of the viruses. Um, but yeah, it would be good to understand that better. Thank you. Is anyone doing any research in that space, Fiona? So looking at the impact of different viruses or different virus complexes on um, productivity? Not so there's so um, Chi has done a little bit of work in her PhD to look at, at quality and, and productivity um, associated to Shiraz disease. Um, it's very hard uh, because there was a whole complex of issues. I think it's very hard to draw some strong conclusions from that, but there may be, a, yeah, obviously there's been an impact, um, but there are other things going on. Um, but overall, we've never really, nobody's really done that kind of R&D. Um, it's long-term research. It's very hard to get funding to do that. Um, be great to do that with a, a winery over a you know period of time if they were prepared to put some infected vines in the ground. <laughs> mm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you'll have any success there. <laughs> yeah, <probably not. laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess that highlights a real question for the industry. Um, what, what do they do when they do have these virus complexes in, in the vineyard? So mm. leaf roll nine and GVA. Um, so we've typically thought that they've probably been less problematic than if you had leaf roll three or leaf roll one. But mm. um, is that really the case, I guess, is where Cap's question is coming yeah. from. And I, so I often say to people, I mean, you know, I think you're better off having healthy material that's uninfected. That um, I think gives you the better chance to manage the, the quality of and the productivity of your vineyards. Um, but by the same token, if you have that issue, then I think the only thing you can really do is, is monitor and evaluate um, year after year whether that is really impactful for you in your situation. Um, and again, you know, there's a whole mixture of things that come into play. So we've got an environmental impact, um, varietal impact, um, the strain of the viruses that are, are present as well. So there's a whole complex of issues um, that, that could impact how the vineyard, um, how sustainable that vineyard becomes. And um, yeah, but I like to start clean, stay clean personally. <laughs> Um, I guess um, following on from the comment you made about biosecurity earlier, if you are choosing to leave that GVA infected um, block in, in the vineyard, then making sure that you're not spreading vectors from that block to a neighbouring block, um, which may have a different set of viruses in it, um, yeah. And combining GBA and leaf roll three, we know creep causes Shiraz disease, which has a huge impact. So yeah. Yeah, that biosecurity yeah. is really critical. It is, it is. And, you know, it's almost, you know, if you're working in, in one block, you will definitely don't go into a block that, you know, is clean. You might not actually want to sort of, it, it might be impractical, but you might not want to move even between blocks on, on the same day until you've, you know, fully washed down your equipment, you've, um, and you've, you know, cleaned your boots and your, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So um, if you're moving between places, yeah, good biosecurity practice about keeping things clean um, is, is super critical. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for you. How do you ensure new planting material is virus free? I'm aware of buying through certified nurseries, but what testing is done at their end to avoid virus material being planted? Yeah, it's, that's also a great question. The testing done by nursery is really up to the nursery to undertake any testing. Um, you hope that they will have sourced their material through those um, uh, vine improvement programs um, where they do um, annual testing of blocks and um, 
and and monitor regularly and you'd hope that your nursery is also monitoring regularly as well um, but I, I can't speak for the different nurseries and what level of testing they do but the certification programs certainly do do testing you know seabine improvement programs um, regularly um, so that's a good place to start making sure that they come from there Great, thank you, Fiona. And just on that topic, One Australia um, is funding um, a project looking at a grapevine um, certification standard. Um, I think Nick Dry, well, I know yeah. Nick Dry is running running that. So yeah. hopefully there'll be more rigour around that process um, in the not too distant future. Yes, yeah, I agree. It'd be really yeah. great to have a good standard that um, yeah, everybody's able to achieve. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, so just on testing, um, so we know that environmental conditions favour um, different environmental conditions favour virus expression, but do weather conditions affect the virus tighter? So hot, yeah. warm temperatures, and do you have to be careful about when you test or collect samples for testing? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I am... Um, uh, viruses and don't replicate well when it's hot, particularly once it gets above 38 degrees. Um, and if you have prolonged hot weather, that can really slow down that replication. They actually prefer to replicate at milder temperatures generally. Um, and that's the whole premise behind um, heat therapy for virus eradication. You know, we grow plants at, at high temperatures for a long period of time and the virus doesn't replicate the plant slowly grows away from that infection point and you can take a little bit of tissue and um, propagate it up in tissue culture to produce a virus-free plant. Um, so, yes, so hot temperatures um, will really will really slow down virus replication. So in the middle of summer when it's stinking hot, I probably wouldn't be testing. Yeah. Um, but we know we can detect viruses most of the time throughout the year um, and you can take, you know, um, sort of mid-spring growth and find something, find virus in that we can test dormant canes and we can test in autumn. Um, and I think, you know, from a propagation point of view for nurseries and vine improvements, if they're actually testing their vines earlier, it's actually really good because they're not, they're not that rushed to take cuttings at that point in time. Um, yeah, and then for growers, um, we'll, we'll try and test at any time of the year, but just don't do it on hot days, basically. Okay. Yeah. Um, and does that follow through to how you um, handle the sample from the time you've collected it to the time it gets to the lab? Yeah. Um, is yeah. So cool essential? You definitely yeah. have to keep the samples cool. Um, if you don't keep the samples cool, they degrade. Um, and then as they degrade, everything kind of, you know, they get a bit mushy and you can't, you can't, extract anything useful out of those to detect viruses. We use molecular methods where we're looking for the, you know, the DNA, the RNA of, of the virus. And um, yeah, that degrades pretty quickly. The viruses and the virus particles in the DNA will, will degrade pretty quickly if, if the samples are not in good condition. And then all these inhibitory compounds come out that affect the test as well. Okay, great. Thank you. So be careful about when you sample and how you handle the sample once once you've collected it. And so we've got a really interesting question from um, or more comment from Richard Smart. I see more trunk disease damage and effect than virus disease in New Yarra Valley vineyards. Any comment? So he thinks trunk disease has a bigger impact than virus right now. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, um, I've talked to Richard about this before and, yeah, he's very passionate about trunk disease occurring in the Yarra Valley. Um, I don't work on trunk disease, so I'm not in a position to sort of comment on the prevalence of the disease there. I think all diseases can be quite impactful and you're at a trunk disease workshop there. So, yes. you know, and so clearly, clearly that is... Um, you know, one of the very many diseases that can affect productivity in your vineyard. And so, again, 
making sure that you're getting high quality planting material to establish your vineyard, whether you're looking for viruses or trunk diseases or anything else is really critical um, in terms of that vineyard sustainability and productivity. Mm, great. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, we have got a um, webinar planned um, that will focus on trunk diseases uh, in September. I think it's the 15th of September. So we've got Reggie and uh, from CSU and Mark, Mark Zesnowski, um from SADI running that webinar for us. Um, so that certainly will be covered. Um, just going back to the um, biological control of um, of the vectors, uh, Fiona, I know this isn't your area of expertise, but I just wondered if you had any thoughts on um, using, so in, in New Zealand, Vaughan and his team have been looking at the concept of using cover crops in the vineyard, not just to attract beneficial insects um, to help control um, the scale and mealybug, but to, he calls it, decouple the vectors from from the grapevines, so planting something that the vectors prefer more than the grapevine, because uh, in reality, the grapevine is not the preferred um, food source for, for mealybugs and scale. There are other plants that they like more, such as clover. So is the concept feasible that you could plant clover in a vineyard to attract the um, mealybug and scale to to those plants and keep them off of off of the the grapevines. What do you think of that as a as a yeah, control strategy? Yeah, look, uh, you know, it may have some merit for sure. And um, they talk a lot. Uh, I've heard about those sort of push pull strategies in other scenarios as well, where you you plant that thing that attracts the vectors away. Um, and keeps them there. And um, it would be really interesting to test. I think that's, I, I think it needs to be tested, but yeah, it, it's definitely a possibility. And then the benefit of having a good cover crop means it's really great for your soil structures and stuff like that. And so, you know, um, yeah, rather than having a bare earth policy or whatever, just having some really good things in there that are, um, you know, have a greater benefit than just the vectors would be a good thing, I think. Wonderful. Um, so, and also, do you just going continuing on on the vector theme? Do you have any thoughts on the correlation between the nitrogen status of of vines and the amount of mealybug and scale that are on those vines? That's something we get asked quite often. Yeah, um, and. I wish I was an entomologist. <laughs> and again, that's not something I can answer. I don't know the answer to that. All right. So maybe the one last question that's more sure. in your area of expertise. You talked about the environmental conditions that favour virus expression. Can you just talk about those conditions a little bit more for us? Yeah. So again, it comes back to those, those sort of high temperatures. So viruses like the mild sort of temperatures for replication. And I guess um, the, the more they replicate, the more likely you are to see symptoms um, because they're starting to harness all the goodies from the cells to impact, um, you know, that, that then leads the impact of symptom expression. And, and you know, th that is a plant response to an infection. Um, so with high temperatures, quite often you won't see symptoms at all um, or you might not see them as severely um, because they don't replicate as much. And that's, that's pretty much it, really. Um, but you might see it more with mild temperatures. Okay. So things like canopy management could also have an yeah. impact. We've got a think, more open canopy where the... That's actually an interesting point. I should have thought of that. But, yeah, there's light intensity as well can actually also impact. And I guess that could be to do with sort of heat at the surface of the leaves. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, you might see symptoms more in a shaded um, environment than you would on the outside because you, you just, whether it's exposure and temperature or something like that. So we often see that impact of, of light intensity affecting symptom expression in a whole range of crops. Yeah. 
Yeah, very interesting. Oh, it's been such a great webinar, Fiona. Thank you for sharing your your knowledge, um, extensive knowledge in this in this area. Um, for those of you um, who missed out on the introduction session, um, so this webinar has been recorded. It will be emailed out to everyone who has registered for the webinar, but it will also be made available via the AWR website um, and thank you again Fiona for for your time today um, it's been much much appreciated and really interesting um, we are about to um, promote the next round of our webinars very shortly um, so the next one is scheduled for the 11th of August and it's on sustainable wine growing Australia giving you an update but as I mentioned we do have a grapevine trunk disease uh, webinar planned for September so watch out for that they get advertised via the AWRI e-bulletin or you can always jump on the website and have a look at what's coming coming up but thank you all for your participation today and thank you Fiona thanks Robin thank you